Uh, there, we there we go. So my absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Catherine Mannix with us, who is going to talk about how to have more tender conversations and experience palliative care, uh, medical, uh, clinical consultant, uh, author of the incredible book with the end in mind and the new book, Listen, um, and how to have tender conversations, which we have to give away for those of you paying attention to the question that we'll bring up at the end of the session. And also um, Dr. Catherine Mannix was responsible for founding the first CBT clinic exclusively for palliative care. So Dr. Kathy Mannitz, welcome so much to our afternoon session. It's an absolute joy to have you here. Michelle, thank you. And hello, everybody. I'm just absolutely thrilled to be here. I do have a few slides which I very naughtily have not sent in advance. So if I'm allowed <laughs> to drive, I am um, going to share. Oh, let me just what my my cunning plan. I hope this fits for all of you is actually not to talk for terribly long because I think if we have a conversation with each other that's far more likely to be a helpful thing for you all so I've, I've you got a few, yeah I've got a, I've got a few slides hang on I'm just adjusting my screen to get the, the Q&A off um, and what I really want to do is is to talk to you just for a little while about the tangles that people get themselves into when they try to have these tender conversations and why, why that might have happened in the first place. And then let's talk to each other. Let's talk about your experience in practice. Let's think about the conversations that people are, are seeking. Let's think about what it is that you discover in your practice and the different ways there are of listening, because of course, it's not only listening with our ears, is it? It's also noticing what it is that you see in somebody's demeanor, where you find their muscle tension is, or what, whatever it is and the, and the area in which you practice. So let's just have a little think about why, why might it be so very difficult? And this first slide really is a bit of a palliative care joke because obviously really the joke is that curtains are ordinarily closing. What I'm trying to do is get us to, to think about opening our ears, opening our minds, starting to think about what is it that makes it so difficult to talk about this really precious and important part of somebody's life. And it will be a part of all of our lives. And yet we do so little preparation and thinking about it. So this is an oak tree in South Carolina and it's near where a very dear friend of mine used to live and she took me to visit it and it was spring it was April when I was there and one of the things that was really interesting to me was that it was covered in tiny little flowers you don't really think about oak trees having flowers do we but obviously they have to have flowers or there wouldn't be acorns in the autumn so this oak tree was doing spring and nobody quite knows how old this tree is. It's called the Angel Oak, and it's on the outskirts of Charleston in South Carolina. And it might be anything between 800 and 2000 years old. And it does spring every year. All those branches that you can see are coming from one original trunk and they're so heavy now that they're lying on the ground and some of them are supported with struts it looks as though it's been there forever. It's certainly been there before this area was settled by the people who came in and colonized after the indigenous Americans. And it looks as though it's immortal, but of course it's not immortal. It will eventually start to die, but not that year, because my friend sent me photographs of the acorns that autumn, it's still going strong. It'll die eventually. I'm gonna die. You're gonna die. All the people we love are gonna die. This is a really cheerful part of the afternoon. All the people we don't like particularly are also gonna die. I'm not sure that's any compensation. But it's a thing that we don't think about. It's a thing that we don't talk about. And it's something that we have devised really clever ways of avoiding. So I want you to think for a little moment just about reflexes that keep us healthy. And one of the reflexes that we have that keeps us healthy 
is our cough reflex, that if something hits the back of our throat that shouldn't be there or meets it in an uncontrolled way, there is a rich nerve supply that straight away triggers coughing. So we don't cough voluntarily, the coughing starts before we've even thought about there being something there. And that's something that stops us from choking and it keeps us alive and it's a really primitive, important reflex. Well, I think that we've started to develop psychological reflexes that are a little bit similar to that. So people who don't want to think about things have reflexes that protect them from thinking about things. So some of you, because there are a couple of dozen of us, it's likely that there'll be at least two of us who really don't like spiders. And for the couple of people who are here, I need to tell you now, I'm going to say that word a few times, but I am not gonna make you look at any pictures of them, okay? But if you have friends who don't like spiders, they really, really don't like spiders. And they take incredible effort to avoid spiders. They don't want to think about spiders. They don't want to think about thinking about spiders. So they are not gonna join you for a barbecue because they've heard about the dusty corners of your shed or certainly my shed. They're not gonna go on camping holidays because they've heard about the toilet blocks. These are people who avoid any particular happenstance that might make them think about the thing of which they're particularly terrified. And these are psychological swerves that they learn to take. And I think that what's happened to us is that we've begun to take psychological swerves about discussing dying. And so instead of using our D words, instead of talking about death and the process of dying and people being dead, we've developed euphemisms. And we talk about sunsets and rainbow bridges, we talk about passing on, passing away, being lost. We have all kinds of metaphors, like I'm thinking about um, caterpillars re-emerging as butterflies into a different way of living, but we're not talking about the process, the ordinary thing that happens at the end of everybody's life, which is dying. So after I've been to visit my friend in South Carolina, I then flew on to South America and went to visit my son who was living there at the time with his girlfriend, who's the daughter of the lady I've been visiting in South Carolina. That's how we met each other. And that girl is now his, his wife, my daughter-in-law. So this photograph is a monarch butterfly that's taken in South America. And this is a monarch butterfly during those extraordinary migrations they take from the south of the American continent up to the north of the American continent each year. We're thinking about the ways in which we have stopped using the language. And because we've stopped using the language of dying and death, we're becoming unused to using the words. And we're also a little bit afraid that if we use the words, somebody else will police our language. So I don't know whether any of you have had this kind of experience, but I had the experience in work, working in a hospital, of chatting to one of the ward clerks on one of the surgical wards that we visited very regularly with the palliative care team. And I knew that she'd been off for a few weeks because her husband had died. And so when I went onto the ward one morning and she was back at her desk and I said to her, Leslie, I'm so glad to see that you're back. I was just so very sorry to hear that your husband had died how are you finding it being back? And she talked a bit about how the ward was being very kind and very supportive and, you know, thank you for mentioning it. And she said, it's funny, a lot of people actually don't, you know, they just don't say anything. And I recognise that that is very familiar. And then Leslie went off to a different part of the ward to do some filing and photocopying, at, what, at which point one of the nurses came up to me and said, Catherine, I can't believe you said dead to Leslie, I just can't believe you did that. And I found that really fascinating because Leslie and I had had a conversation that was cordial, it was warm, it was compassionate, it was person to person. And we'd used D words and we talked about her dead husband and we talked about how she was finding it. 
but a third person, a person who wasn't involved in our conversation, then came over to police my use of words, to tell me off for having used D words in front of somebody who was recently bereaved, as though in some way I might have reminded Leslie that her husband had died because she'd come to work and completely forgotten. So it's interesting that we've got this kind of word police thing going on and then we start to do it to ourselves. Is it gonna be okay if I say this? Is it gonna be okay if I ask that question? And that's the sort of language that I want us to talk to each other about as we're having this conversation. So one of the things that's difficult is that we've forgotten what ordinary dying looks like, but we get presented with extraordinary dying on TV a lot of the time. So here are a few scenes from screen deaths, and they're always things that are very, very unusual. So some of you will remember this from, um, I think this is EastEnders, somebody who is a, a, a young mum who is dying. She's on a ventilator. They've managed to deliver her baby. Um, and now her ventilator is going to be turned off. Now that probably happens in UK medicine once or twice in a very, very long time. But these kinds of deaths are actually not at all unusual on screens. Or we have people who are found dead, but we don't ever see their dying process. Or we have you know, the awkwardness of being shot by orcs on your way to Tesco's. Or we have this kind of story. So Ethel on EastEnders, there was a really good terminal care story here and her painkillers were being carefully managed and all the rest of it. But actually EastEnders found that the public were getting up and turning the kettle on during those scenes. And that's how they know people are not paying attention. And so what had in fact been quite an informative and helpful plot, plot line turned into an assisted dying plot line simply to hold on to viewers. And I find that really demoralizing that we can't just talk about ordinary dying on our screens. In fact, it's really difficult to find depictions of ordinary dying. Some of you will recognize this is Tom Hanks as the character Andy in the film Philadelphia. He's a, a young lawyer dying of AIDS during the 1990s. And in fact, the terminal illness here was incredibly well portrayed but we still didn't see him dying. We saw a kind of reconciliation scene between him and the Denzel Washington character who was his antagonist. And then we move and the action is in a graveyard and that's how we know that the person's died. But we haven't seen ordinary dying. So people don't know what to expect, but they're shown things that are so extraordinary and frightening on their screens that they imagine that that's based on reality and so they are very, very frightened of what might lie ahead. Meanwhile, back in Ecuador, because I did tell you these were my holiday snaps, didn't I? This is a funeral shop. This is uh, a town in the northern um, Andes. And this isn't a particularly touristy town. This is just a, a local market town. And there are several things about this shop that really struck me and was the reason why I, I took the photograph. So first of all, you can see this is an ordinary high street. And if you have a look at the shop next door, it's a cafe. And in fact, it's a really popular cafe. I had to wait for quite a while for the queue to move that was queuing past the funeral shop, chatting, laughing, leaning on the coffins while they were waiting to get into the cafe. Once the, the crowd had cleared, I took my photograph. The other thing that you can see, and those of you who speak Spanish will notice this, is that there's a sale on. So there's, there's a sale of mortuary boxes, which is Spanish for, um, for coffins. And you'll see also that they're not pretending that tiny people don't die. Look at that teeny tiny white coffin on the top of that stack. So um, almost everybody who dies in Ecuador will uh, have a funeral that involves a coffin being uh, not put into the ground because it's too volcanic, but actually having a breeze block um, grave built around it is the usual way of the equivalent of burial. Um, and cremation is very, very rare there. So in the middle of life, there is death, there is dying, there's discussion of dying. And the reason that there's a sale on in this shop is that it's one of three funeral shops on the same short high street. 
nobody's pretending that it doesn't happen. And in fact, this shop has been so successful that it's taken over the premises of what has been a fruit shop. That's why it's so uh, gloriously adorned. And the fruit shop has moved one stop further down the hill to our right as we're looking at this photograph. So here is a community that has words about dying and death, that doesn't hide their funeral directors away. And when you think about what a, a British funeral directors looks like, you often can't tell that it's about funerals at all. They, they look like a solicitor's office or a bank. So what I'm trying to do, and what I'd like to invite all of you to join me in doing, is helping to offer people a window into ordinary dying what the process is likely to do to their bodies as their bodies gradually weaken during their illness, what the final process of dying is likely to be like because it's far more gentle than most people are expecting, how they can relax into living their dying instead of feeling that now that I cannot get better, my life is over. What can we do that is building people up so their personhood still really matters to the very, very last moments of their living. So I want to think with you about what are the things that people might want to ask you, might want to talk to you about, might want to worry about in the relaxed and safe space that you are creating around them. Sometimes people can't ask those questions in front of the people that they love. And if you are creating a space which is a sanctuary for somebody, it may be that that gives them the calm and the courage to be able to talk about things that they've never before been able to talk about with anybody else. And that's a really important part of our whole community support of our sickest and most fragile people. So here at the very edge of somebody's life, what is it that you might be noticing? It might be what they ask or what they say. It might be the changes that you're seeing in them over time because you've got to know them. It might be that you're starting to see weight changes or muscle tension changes, changes in the way they're moving, changes in their level of comfort. But what you might also be seeing, and we see this uh, so often in people who realize that the very end of their life is approaching, is that freedom to actually celebrate the things that are important and to appreciate the everyday and not get stuck on the banal and not really terribly important things that trouble us all of the time when we haven't really got a grip on what matters most. And when time is precious and when energy is limited, people have only got energy to dedicate to the things that absolutely matter most. So I want to advocate that we become listeners, that we understand the process of ordinary dying and that we're not afraid to talk to people about it. So let's take a moment to think about the process of ordinary dying. Because the thing that is extraordinary to me is that this isn't taught in schools of nursing. This wasn't taught to me at medical school. This is something that I had to discover as a junior doctor. And once I realized that there was a process, I couldn't not see it. So let's think about human bodies and the processes that they're evolved to go through. And I want to compare here being born with dying because we know that pregnancy has a particular sequence and towards the end of pregnancy, the body gets ready to give birth. And we know that during the sequence of giving birth to a baby, the body um, does a particular set of things in a particular order. Some bits take longer than others from one woman in labor to another, but every midwife sees the same basic process happening in every single labor. And when things start to not follow the normal process, that's the point at which a midwife knows that it's time to intervene, to, 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 intervene, to steer things, to keep baby and mum safe and to keep mum comfortable enough to complete the process of giving birth. So we know that it's individual because every person is individual, 
and yet it is a bodily process that's got a particular sequence. And guess what? The end of life is very similar. It doesn't seem to matter what the diagnosis is, what the illness or the illnesses are that the person has. Towards the very end of their lives, we see the same things happening. We see people becoming more tired. We see people not having as much energy as they used to have. We see that in anybody who's had a serious illness, even while they're recovering, that they sleep more, that they do less. And gradually, if they're recovering, they sleep less and less and do more and more. During dying, what we see is the person is sleeping more and more and doing less and less. And that sleep is a kind of energy recharge for them. It's a bit like a mobile phone battery that just isn't holding its charge anymore, sleeping more, but having less advantage from that sleep until in the end the person is awake only for short periods and is asleep for most of the time. And during that period of time, we might notice something really interesting has happened, but the person won't notice it. And that's that during those periods of being asleep, the person dips into being not just asleep, but completely unconscious, in a coma, completely unrousable. And yet later they will lighten and they will awaken and they'll tell us they've had a perfectly nice sleep. But we will know maybe because a visitor came or it was medicine time that we tried very, very hard to get them to waken up and we weren't able to waken them. Now, if there are particular medicines that they need to maintain their comfort, once this period of intermittent unconsciousness starts, then we don't want somebody to miss a dose of, for example, painkillers or treatment for breathlessness or nausea. And then by the time they wake up again, their symptoms have come back full force. So very often at that point in time, we'll find a different way of giving their medicines that doesn't rely on them being awake enough to swallow them. The problem with that is that we have a misunderstanding that using injected drugs and using syringe drivers to give the same amount of drug just to get the same amount of symptom relief is somehow associated in the public's mind with being very close to death and a worry that it's using the syringe driver that causes the dying rather than we use a syringe driver because we've reached a point in somebody's illness where that's the only way that we can make sure that their discomfort doesn't come back. The syringe driver is not causing their unconsciousness. It's that natural process that happens even when people are not using any medications that causes the unconsciousness. And eventually a person is unconscious all of the time. And now we start to see another change that once the person's brain is only alert at the level of the respiratory center, we've got breathing that is just a reflex set of patterns. They're not aware of their breathing, they're not aware of that really important sensitive area in the back of their throat. And so they stop clearing their throat. They allow bits of saliva or fluid that's been used for cleaning the mouth to gather there. They're still breathing. So the breath is bubbling through what might be a tiny film of fluid, but it makes quite a noisy bubbling noise. It's the noise we refer to as the death rattle. And people say it as though it's something dreadful, you know, the death Rattle. But actually what it's saying is this person can't even feel their throat anymore. They're so deeply unconscious that they're no longer protecting their airway the way we all would normally in daily life. And so messages of sensation from their body are not reaching and disturbing their brain. A person who's breathing in this way is not conscious enough to be experiencing distress. The respiratory patterns go from deep to shallow, back to deep, back to shallow. And at the same time, they're weaving between fast breathing, gradually becoming slower, often with pauses, sometimes with very long pauses, and then another sudden return to fast breathing and then gradually slowing. And during one of those periods of very slow breathing, often with pauses, there will be a breath out that isn't remarkable, it isn't different, but it isn't followed by another breath in. It turns out that was the last breath. But unlike on the television, there's no screaming, choking, feeling of fading away. It's very, very gentle. And all of us who work in palliative care 
have had the experience of walking into a room where a person's been unconscious for some time, surrounded by their beloveds, and their breathing has stopped sometime in the last few minutes, and the family hasn't noticed yet because they're waiting for something dramatic to happen. And so to be able to draw families' attention to the person's face looking comfortable during that breathing, to making sure that people are not mistaking the breathing, which is noisy, for some kind of sighing or groaning or trying to speak or distress, because I've met lots of people who've come away from deathbeds thinking they've seen great distress, when actually what they've seen is deep unconsciousness and this automatic breathing cycle before that very gentle end to breathing. Being able to describe that to somebody is an enormous gift and my experience is that once I've described it to someone, there's almost always a kind of pause while they take it in. And then the first thing that they say is, could you tell my wife that? Could you tell my children that? Will you tell my parents that? That's not what everybody's expecting. We thought it was going to be so much worse than that. Please tell them so they can take comfort from that. So knowing what to expect is one of the ways that we can help people to take comfort. And you may well be creating the safe space in which a conversation like that could take place. So I want to think with you about those conversations, about the tenderness, about the sorts of things that you wonder about talking about, about the sorts of things that your clients have brought up with you. And let's do that now in a conversation with each other instead of me hogging the screen and all of the talking. Over to you. It's all gone very quiet. Michelle, are you there? I am typing in here, sorry, I was just typing away to you. <laughs> I, I can see somebody else is sort of typing too. So um, let's get everyone sort of typing in any sort of comments, thoughts, reflections on what Catherine has put so far. Anne's put, Dr. Catherine, I couldn't tear myself away from your beautiful tender words and description of a natural death. I was fortunate to experience this with my father and it removed a lot of fear about the process, but no one ever explained this, so many thanks. I think that's a, that's a really key point I find a lot, Catherine, is that when working with, with um, people in, in, from a touch-led point of view is acceptance, and quite often they may have accepted um, their diagnosis or that the, the end is near, but it's the people that love and care about them that don't, and sometimes it's that resistance that I find a lot of people struggle with, um, is that, you know, they're, they're realistically considering, you know, what might be the reality in three months, six months, and the ones around them are saying, no, you know, be positive, Che, you know, and it's this oh, you know, constant yeah. desire, to, desire to survive and, and to, to move through that, that people struggle with. That's so important, isn't it? And we've got this situation where people are saying, come on, mum, one more round of chemotherapy. And actually, chemotherapy is now of no additional benefit to mum it's maybe going to make her feel sick for 10 days out of the next 21 days it's going to dissipate her her energy levels and actually she could spend the next 21 days feeling not as bad and doing things that matter to her more so it is really difficult when everybody in the family all loving each other are all at different places in that journey of acceptance and understanding, isn't it? And I think that is really, really difficult. And of course, we're dealing usually with one person. We might be dealing with the person who's sick, or we might be supporting their spouse or their friend or their daughter or whoever. So we only get one window into what's going on. We only get the, the, the story that we hear from the person who's in front of us. 
So maybe one of the things that's useful is to talk to them about being curious. You know, if your family keeps closing you down when you want to talk about this, then the more you insist on trying to talk about it, the more they're going to resist. But families almost always want to help each other to feel better. So if you parcel it differently, if you parcel it as, guys, I need to talk to you about something because it's really worrying me, it's disturbing me, I wake up in the middle of the night, I'm worrying about it, and I want you all to help me with this. And now it's, oh yeah, what can we do? What do you want to talk about? What is it? Well, I want to talk about the balance between the benefits of having more treatment and the possible benefits of stopping treatment and concentrating on my quality of life rather than the length of living. And I'm trying to work out what to do about that. But all of the time when I think about it, I worry that you will be sad or you will be cross or you will feel let down if I give up the treatment. And I need to be doing the thing that's best for me. And I want you to help me to work out what that is. And, and now we're in a different place for a conversation. Yeah, that's really powerful. That, that reframe is so incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, and I think, you know, there's there are also situations um, where I find a, a lot of clients that have been given either a, a sort of an end of life diagnosis or, or are moving into a sort of hospice setting that haven't processed the emotion themselves. They're holding on to, to anger and, and resistance. We've talked about today, obviously, why lots of reasons why people get cancer. Um, and of course, we have lots of people who are diagnosed at a, a very late or aggressive stage and are angry at the process. They're young or they feel like they didn't do anything wrong or they don't understand mm. why they've got it and someone else who lives a much more reckless life didn't. And, and, and there's all of these mixed emotions that they're then struggling to deal with. So how would you, from a, from a practitioner point of view, dealing with a client that still has this abundance of anger and why me, uh, what sort of advice could you give there, Catherine? I think it's really, really important. And one of the problems that people who are really angry have is everybody else is so frightened by their anger that they meet people who are constantly either literally or metaphorically doing that to them. Don't be cross, keep it in, control it, contain it. So they're abandoned in their anger. And perhaps it's too hard for them even to express their anger in front of people who they love and are fearful of hurting. You know, a, a young, young person who's got children at home and doesn't want to be being angry at home, well, where else can they go with their anger? Well, in fact, the therapeutic space that you're all offering is one of those places that they can go with their anger. And it might be that our curiosity is saying, how does it feel? And you, you will notice people who are angry have lots and lots of should in their in their language, how things should be, how unfair thing that things shouldn't be. And when people are using the language of must and should and mustn't and shouldn't, very often underneath that there is anger and the anger is either turned outwards and it is anger or it's turned inwards and it becomes guilt and shame. So once we start hearing those sorts of words, we can use that as the kind of um, in, if you like. So you, I, I can hear you saying how unfair you feel this is. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? We just need to offer to listen. We just need to make the invitation. We don't need to do anything clever. We simply need to create space for them. And now they can talk about that it isn't fair, that I'm not gonna see my children grow up, um, that my um, person who I'm thinking of who's lived this terrible life and they're really degenerate and everything wonderful is happening to them and look at me I don't deserve this it often can be extremely tearful they've been very very afraid of being tearful a lot of people tell us don't they I'm so worried if I start to cry I'll never be able to stop and those tears aren't always sorrow sometimes those tears are rage and guilt and shame and it's really, really helpful for people to be able to have that emotional release, do the crying, do the raging, tear some paper. Um, one hospice that I worked at used to provide people with a rolling pin and plasticine so they could just 
make models and then bash it. They used to make uh, a, a model of um, their cancer that they were angry with, or they would make a model of something that depicted even a person that they were angry with. And then they would belt seven bells out of it with this Roman <laughs> thing. And they felt so much better afterwards. And because it was slightly wacky, it also made them laugh afterwards. You know, I felt really terrible about beating Dr. So-and-so over the head with a rolling pin, but boy, I feel better. So we're told that anger is not a good emotion. And of course, no emotion is good or bad, it just is. And what's really important is that people can get the, the thinking that's underneath that emotion out and express it and maybe interrogate it a bit, listen to themselves, hear their own words, understand themselves. That's what I'm angry about. I've been so busy trying not to be cross, holding it all in, that I haven't even understood for myself what it is that I'm angry about. Yeah, yeah. that's so yeah. powerful. And a lot of people are still very afraid of death. As you said, it's not depicted well, um, you know, if at all. And I think particularly in the West, having lived over in, in Asia, where actually, um, you know, death is more celebratory and, and sort of a, a coming together. And actually, even my partner, who's who's Italian, you know, if, if somebody, you know, sort of passes in, in their village, you know, everyone comes out to, to celebrate. And um, it, it's a it's a it's a more uh, together occasion and it's it's a celebration of life much more where I think uh, particularly here in, in the UK and, and, and I think sort of uh, the US and, and kind of you know this sort of area we just want to close it down we, we don't want to talk about it we don't want to think about it and even as it happens as, as you said um, it's about you know quite often it's about trying to, to disconnect that conversation and, and to not then elaborate on it and just let time do its thing. Um, what is it that you think makes us so afraid? I, I suspect it's individual. I suspect it's very different from person to person. So for some people, they're frightened of the process. For some people, they're frightened of the idea of not existing. There are some people who are frightened of carrying on existing in a different way, um, not being good enough, being judged, going to hell, what would reincarnation be like if I actually haven't lived a good enough life and I end up in a place or an existence that isn't as happy as this one? Depends on, on their own individual beliefs and faith as well, doesn't it? Um, and so perhaps one of the things we can most helpfully do is to ask the person what it is about it that's worrying them, because we can explain the process and take some of the fear of the physical process away very often some of that fear is what will my family see will my family be perturbed forever if they're with me as i'm dying um, so actually for grandparents and parents who might have small children who want to be visiting them to be able to talk to them about what's likely to happen what the kids are likely to see can be really really helpful because what the kids are going to see is well it's snorry it's you looking extremely sleepy and dull and boring and not saying very much. Um, and young kids are likely to wander in and out of the room, see all the grown-ups being quiet and wander off again. So to be able to create a space where, where the children can wander in and out is, is another really important thing. People are frightened to take the children in. So the children aren't allowed in. Well, we know about children. They've got these wonderful imaginations. And they live in a universe where there are dragons. So we're not allowed to go through that door where grandpa is. And grandpa is making very funny snoring noises and something terrible is happening in there to my grandpa. And nobody will let me see it. Whereas to come in and see grandpa lying with his mouth open, not looking at his elegant vest, possibly not with his teeth in, making snoring noises, but actually there are no dragons, there are no monsters. People are sad because grandpa's getting ready to die and we won't be able to see him anymore after he's died. Ordinary words, little sentences, all understandable. And now actually, okay, so grandpa's in there. He's no fun. I can't play with him. I can't talk to him. Um, I can sing him a song and then I'll go downstairs and I'll do whatever I was doing before. So there are ways of constructing this so that it's not frightening for children. But once somebody's got existential fear, I think that's very different and we very often might need specialist psychological support or support from clergy if they're a person of faith 
to help them with that kind of fear. Yeah, amazing. Thank you, Catherine. I'm just going to read. There's a couple of comments that have come in here. Um, where are we there? That was Anne, uh, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. This is what made me go on to volunteer in hospice care. Thank you for sharing that, Elizabeth. Lisa Hemmings, what a lovely way of explaining this. No one talks about it. And I often feel I shouldn't either. Yeah, I think mm. that's, that's a common thought. And I think you've touched on it a little bit there, Catherine, haven't you? But I, it is that kind of thing you don't think you're supposed to talk about. Yeah. And yet it's not medical knowledge, is it? It's people knowledge. It's the wisdom of the village. And before we've medicalized dying, what would have happened when somebody was dying is that they would have sent for the wise person, usually the wise woman. She was usually the person who attended births. She would certainly be the person who'd come along and help you with the laying out after a death. And she'd also pop in and check that things were going to plan around a deathbed as well. And who would those wise women have been? Well, we've probably got 21 of them on this call right now. We are the people who are tuned in with sensitivity to other people. That's what's brought us into the professions that we're in. So we probably would have been those people and it would have been recognised that it would have been OK to talk to us about that. So let's claim that back. This isn't about medicine, it's about people. Yeah, absolutely. I, lo I love that. And I think, as, as you say, it's kind of it's 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 the village sort of mentality and that community and sense of connection mm -hmm. um, that, that we've kind of lost. Anne's put here as well. I wish all medical professionals were trained to understand death better and support patients and families through this final and so important life stage. Yeah, me too. I think it is getting better, but I think that it isn't taught yet at undergraduate level. So in fact, one of the things I've been really encouraged about over the last two years is the number of different ambulance training schools. So universities who are teaching paramedic science or ambulance trusts who've asked people who I know or me or a combination to talk to them about managing dying when they get to somebody's house from a 999 call in a crisis. And what they find is not a previously well person who suddenly collapsed and needs to be taken to a hospital and saved, but a person who's been known to be dying for some considerable time and the family just panicked when there's been a step change in that person and now they can't wake them up anymore, for example. And actually for the paramedics, instead of going into full, you know, blues and twos, to be able to, to calm everybody down, talk about ordinary dying, help the family observe what's actually happening here, get the kettle on, do those kind of normalizing things. That, and it's all about, I know I keep saying these words, but it's all about creating the space. It's all about making that a safe place for this really important thing to happen in. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Beautiful. Couldn't agree more. And Marcus put here, unfortunately, I wasn't there when my father passed, but my partner was there. He described it as so peaceful and he left with such dignity, which was very reassuring for me to hear. Thank you for sharing, Mark. Thank you, Mark. And, uh, do you know, one of the things that I find very interesting is how people who haven't been there at the time and are told what happened fall into two groups. So there's Mark, who's immensely reassured by being told what happened. And then there's a group of other people who think, yeah, you're all making that up. It obviously was so terrible that you've devised this story so that I won't be upset. And a few years ago, I was talking to a group of medical students who were about to start their ward um, attachment. So they've been at medical school for a couple of years. Um, and I was talking to them about the process of dying and how one of the things I wanted them to do over the next year was to try to sit with dying people and learn how to be with them when your stethoscope and all your pills and potions are no use to you at this point. The only thing you've got to bring is yourself as a human being. Um, and I described the process of dying. And as I was describing it, a girl was getting noticeably more upset and eventually she left the room. So I can't go after her, but I knew there was an administrator outside. And when, of course, at the end of the session, I went and found her and she's sitting with the administrator there having a cup of tea and there's lots of tears and lots of scrunched up tissues. 
But actually what had happened was over the previous summer, she'd gone to study abroad. She'd been in Kenya when her very beloved grandmother had died. And the family had decided not to tell her while she was away because she couldn't get home anyway. And they didn't want her to be distressed mm -hmm. and bereft and without their comfort. So when she came home, they explained to her that her grandmother had died, which was not an enormous surprise. But they then explained to her how she had died and they explained this process of dying to her. And she'd become completely convinced that this was a confabulation by the family together. And it was only six months later, as this complete stranger is describing the ordinary process of dying to her class. And what she heard me saying was exactly what her family had told her, that she suddenly realized that actually that was the way her grandmother had died and her suffering hadn't been terrible. And she was kind of released from this prison of, of grief and anger and resentment that the family were telling her something that was so peaceful, it seemed to her not to be believable. So we've got to stop this being a secret, haven't we? We've got to pass it on and help people to know what ordinary dying looks like. And partly because of course, if it doesn't look like that, if it's going wrong, going back to the birth analogy, when a birth is going wrong, we do something, we get help to get things back on course. And so if somebody isn't dipping into unconsciousness and looking peaceful, but is being grabbed back from unconsciousness by mm -hmm. distressing symptoms that stimulate their brain, brain so much that it wakes them up again, then we shouldn't be tolerating that. We should at that point be seeking help to get the symptoms soothed because we know that when symptoms aren't bothering people, this is what the process of dying looks like. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that knowledge is so powerful, Catherine, isn't it? As you say, it, it, it dissipates the fear. I mean, even just listening to you, I can feel the, the fear of, of that word, even for myself, kind of dissipate because it's, it's that knowledge and experience you have of seeing it. And as you say, you know, most of us um, have been fortunate enough not to, to sort of uh, see someone we, we love or care about die, or if we have, um, as you say, it's normally been quite traumatic or, or uh, you know, a sort of an unknown experience as we weren't there. And, and that, you know, sort of perception of reality um, kind of fades our, our sort of judgment and, and mind. Nikki's put here, I wish I had heard you when I started my training. I spoke up in a training session at a massage course about being a safe space for clients to vent or talk. And they told me off and said that this wasn't my job. Uh, ironically, this is what has set me apart from other therapists because I do talk and I do listen. And oh my goodness, thank God you do, Nikki. Um, and thank you know, hopefully you're not going back to that training school. Um, but that's uh, yeah, I mean that's an important one, isn't it? There there is an element of and actually, you know, we we do hear it with with um, uh, therapy anyway. I mean, of course, being a hands-on therapist. There is a lot of counsel. I mean, people take that opportunity to share lots of things in a treatment room, in the safety and sanctuary of a one-on-one -on -one space, primarily either with a stranger, um, someone they're not going to see again and, and can release in that way, or with someone who they've built a longer term relationship with um, and, and feel, you know, they can trust them, but they're not a, an, an emotionally connected loved one or, or family yeah. member. Um, so can kind of share, but there are a lot of people that, um, I mean, I've always tried to fight for um, our industry teaching therapists some psychotherapeutic skills and some talking therapies because I think it's a great skill as a hands-on therapist to have but there are those that do believe no that's not their job our job is to do the process of a treatment and and sort of you know anything up and outside of that um, is, is not into all so I, I can understand where that's come from what are your thoughts with with that Catherine from what you've seen because I know you you're a massive advocate for touch I think that we are people first and foremost, and we get a little bit hung up on hierarchies and professions and who do job is that, don't we? So each one of these people is an individual, and if they feel safe to talk, then whoever we are, whatever our role is, part of our role is to accept that they felt that sense of safety and just pave the way for them to be able to say, what it is that they want to say now they might tell us something that we don't have the capacity to deal with they might tell us um so i guess it would be the same thing as somebody disclosed to you uh, a, a history of being abused it would be the same thing if you were um 
uncovering somebody for massage and you discovered they were covered in bruises and you uh, unclosed a, a story of domestic violence you know that there are some other people now who need to be involved with that and that your job is to stand alongside that person to give them the courage to do the reporting that they need to choose to do because it's not for us to choose is it it's for them to choose but I think this is the same if somebody wants to talk to us about dying or if they talk to me I can say well you know I've seen it 10 12 15 thousand times it generally looks like this if you haven't seen thousands and thousands of people die though you can still say do you know what people who I've listened to who've seen this happen a lot they tell me that this is this is what happens so you you know I can speak with my hands on my heart but you can speak with your hands on my heart if that's what you need if you haven't got the experience of your own beautiful I love that I love that you can speak with my your hands on my heart um what a, what a beautiful beautiful statement uh Jerry's put beautiful yep yeah, couldn't agree more Jerry uh, Elizabeth a good death can be a lovely thing to bring great comfort to the bereaved in the days ahead and isn't that really important and don't you meet sometimes in your line of work people whose grieving has been complicated by not having been there or by having heard those breathing noises and thinking that person that they loved was suffering horribly because they didn't understand that they were deeply unconscious. Or sometimes we do meet people who seem difficult and uncomfortable dying because we mustn't pretend that that doesn't happen, but it's really, really unusual. And so you've got that space for a person to be able to unburden and talk about that. And one of the things that, that we know um, is that if a person can feel those strong emotions and be, be calmed at the same time, which is what you're offering them through therapeutic touch, that they will be less in dread of letting those emotions out the next time because they won't feel so out of control because you've helped them to feel safe and contained, even though they also experience those really strong emotions at the same time. So you're giving them resilience for their future processing. Amazing. And Nikki has put here, I am currently working with a client who is a good friend, also who is dying. We have discussed at length how she wants her surroundings to be and the ambience of the room to be and the space that she is looking forward to, uh, sorry, the piece that she is looking forward to. Such important conversations to have to both see what her wishes are and also preparing the family that it is all okay. And I think, I mean, wow. you mentioned that in your book, don't you, about creating space is a, a big part of, of your conversation. And isn't that a fantastic job to be doing, Nikki? I'm really sorry, because this is really hard when it's your friend. But wow, it's also a, a gift that you've got to be able to give this friend. And it's wonderful to be able to help with that very, very difficult thing. And I hope that for you, when your friend has died, being able to do this work together now, is something that will be a great comfort to you in your bereavement afterwards too. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Nikki, thank you for, for sharing. It's humbling and I'm so grateful to be there in both capacities, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure, I'm sure. Catherine, uh, we are fastly running out of time, although I could curl up and just get another cup of tea and listen to you. Um, all evening um, you just have the the most beautiful tone to your voice anyway um, that is so much comfort in and of itself but just ooze wisdom um, around what is often a very difficult conversation and a difficult topic for most of us to sort of get our, our head around and I am very grateful that you have took the time to join us um, and share the breadth of your um, experience and to give us all comfort um, in sort of what it means to be dying and how we can all approach that and conversations around it uh, with much more heart. So thank you so much uh, for joining us and for spending time with us today. My pleasure and my honour, everybody. Thank you very much for, for letting me join you. Enjoy, Enjoy your next few days. It looks like a great programme. Thank you. And just before Catherine goes, um, Catherine, I'm going to let you pick a question. Sorry, throwing you on the spot. Um, 
we're going to give away a copy of your new book, Listen, How to Find the Words for Tender Conversations. I haven't even got to read it myself yet, but I do have a copy upstairs. Um, and um, I, I mean, the, with the end in mind, is a beautiful book too. I'm really looking forward to this one. But we normally get a group to kind of put in the chat first person to put in the chat the answer to a question um, so if you'd like to think of a question that they need to answer and then we will um, ping this out to the winner so they also have a chance to read it. Okay so one of the um, sections in this book deals a bit more explicitly than the first book did with cognitive behaviour therapy um, and the way we can translate that so when it talks about the four cornerstones of human experience so they are bodily sensations and responses, emotions, thoughts, and what's the fourth cornerstone? Bodily sensations, emotions, thoughts, and... Elizabeth says spirit, Anne Murray says soul. Great answers, but not the cognitive therapy the cornerstone, cornerstones. Ali K says feeling. And that's tricky because I guess feelings might be physical sensations or emotions, but not, not, not the fourth one. one. Who's going to get it? Keep putting your answers into the chat. We talked about it a little bit before when I said we're not really aware of our thoughts, but they very often come out as emotions or... Claire Caddick has put intuition, Nikki feelings, Elizabeth consciousness. You're all being very ethereal and this is much more concrete than they that. said subconsciousness. I should have talked to you all while I was writing the book. Your answers are much more Anne Murray, <laughs> Anne Murray behaviour. Behaviour. Well done, Anne. Well done. Fantastic. So, Anne, a copy of Catherine's amazing book, Listen, How to Find the Words for Tender Conversations, is on the way to you. And I know you will um, relish that, as I know the type of therapist you are as well. So, um, again, thank you so much, Catherine. I am getting lots of comments in the, in the chat sort of coming up to say thank you to you as well. Um, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for spending time Thanks, with us. Thanks, everybody. It's an absolute joy to, uh, to uh, listen to to you and to uh, sharing your wisdom. Thank you. Wishing you all well. Bye-bye. Thanks, Catherine.